Okay, so welcome to this second video on long-term potentiation. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing uh, the uh, synaptic transmission process across a glutamatergic synapse. So we're just discussing the action potential in uh, this axon terminal and how that then is coupled to the release of glutamate, just as a bit of a revision. Okay, so uh, these voltage-gated sodium channels open when the uh, electrical potential difference across the cell membrane gets to minus 40 millivolts volts, which is the threshold potential for the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, now basically they stay open for a little while, and then they start to close again. And just as they start to close, what happens is that another type of channel that was in this membrane uh, was the voltage-gated potassium channel. So this is a voltage-gated potassium channel. Voltage-gated potassium channel. Okay, and basically these were activated usually at the same point as uh, the voltage-gated sodium channels were over-activated. Uh, the difference is that they take a much longer time to open than the voltage-gated sodium channels. So they start opening at the same point as the uh, sodium channels are just about closing. Now the closing of the sodium channels means that there's no more sodium current coming into the cell, and the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels means that potassium starts leaving the cell. So potassium starts leaving the cell. That's a movement of positive charge out of the cell. So that's going to make the intracellular potential lower, and it, you're moving positive charge into the extracellular compartment. So that's going to make the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment more positive. So that means this side's becoming more positive, this side's becoming more negative. So if we move from here to here, and the electrical potential difference is going to be getting more negative, basically. So how much lower this one is, the intracellular compartment's electrical potential is, than the extracellular compartment's electrical potential, it's going to be getting more low, basically. So that causes the repolarization phase of the action potential. It slightly overshoots, and then um, it basically returns to resting potential as the voltage-gated potassium channels close. Okay, right. Uh, so... The other important thing is that's just the normal action potential within cells. But the important thing that happens in axon terminals is that we have another important channel, basically. So where should I draw this? I'll put it here, but it should really be close to those ones over there. Okay, so this is the uh, either an N-type or a uh, PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, so I'm just going to put all the auxiliary subunits in just to remind ourselves. So here is the gamma subunit, the beta subunit, and the alpha 2 delta subunit sitting off here. So basically, uh, this is a voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, now voltage-gated calcium channels are quite complicated structures. They have the main subunit, which is this pore-forming unit in the middle, so I'll highlight that first. So what colour should I do it in? Orange, I think. So they have this pore-forming unit right at the centre, which is made up of uh, an alpha subunit. Okay, so that's the alpha subunit there. And basically, in the axon terminal, the alpha subunit is a specific type of alpha subunit. So there are many different alpha subunits that you can use. There are loads of genes coding for different alpha subunits. I think it's... Um, how many are there? I think it's about 10 different alpha subunit genes that are known. Basically, if... Um, if uh, in the axon terminals of neurons, uh, the alpha subunits that you use are the alpha subunits coded for by K, uh, CAV uh, 2.1, which is called the PQ type, PQ type, or you can also use the CAV 2.2, which is called the N type voltage gated calcium channel. So you use either one of these two alpha subunits. And basically, when you use those alpha subunits, the whole name of the potassium channel is then named after the alpha subunit. So no matter what auxiliary subunits you use, the name of the calcium channel, if you use this CAV 2.1 as your alpha subunit, is a PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Similarly, if you use CAV 2.2, the whole cal voltage-gated calcium channel is then named an N-type voltage-gated potassium channel. However, these auxiliary subunits do exist, and you have this little one here, which is the beta subunit, this one here is the gamma subunit, and this box is the alpha 2 subunit, and then the line going into the cell membrane, that's the delta subunit. So they are linked by a disulfide bond, which I haven't really shown. But the important thing to know is that these are either PQ-type or N-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And basically, when the electrical potential difference across the membrane of the axon terminal gets up to minus 40 millivolts, 
what happens is that these channels open just like uh, the voltage-gated sodium channels and the voltage-gated potassium channels. Now, they allow calcium, basically, to come into the cell. Okay, now what I really should have drawn is this, this channel is going to be very, very closely positioned with uh, these synaptic vesicles. So, uh, this alpha-2 subunit has, in its, uh, has as part of it a, a domain known as the metal ion dependent adhesion domain. So, where should I put that? Um, the um, metal ion dependent adhesion. Um, okay, right, so, um, um, MIDAS it's called. Metal ion dependent adhesion site, I think it must be, rather than domain. Uh, so that stands, and I don't know why, I don't really want to write it over there, that'll ruin the picture. But that stands for the metal ion dependent adhesion site. Dependent adhesion site. Okay, and basically what that is, is a site which will bind to proteins which are associated with the docked vesicles, basically. So what this assures you is that this uh, N-type or PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel will be positioned nearby synaptic vesicles, basically. So, when these open, they allow calcium to come in, and calcium is then going to trigger the uh, fusion of this synaptic vesicle with the membrane. Okay, so shall we have a brief revision of how it uh, induces um, Fusion. So we'll draw this out here. So basically, if we have a synaptic vesicle here, which contains our glutamate, so this contains our glutamate, so I'll put in here, there is glutamate in here. Basically, what happens is that you have uh, synaptic vesicles containing glutamate docked at the membrane. And basically, this involves a bunch of proteins all interacting to hold the synaptic vesicle close to the membrane. Now, uh, there are two types. Uh, these proteins, by the way, are called snare proteins. And uh, these, um, um, which stands for soluble N NSF um, adhesion regulators, I think, receptors, adhesion receptors, I think that's what it stands for, snare proteins, which I think stands for soluble um, NSF adhesion, uh, solu um, soluble NSF adhesion receptors, I think. Hmm. Anyway, snare proteins. Um, so basically there are two types of snare proteins. The V-snares, which are the snare proteins that are within the glutamate receptor, and then the T-snares, which are the snares which are attached to the uh, presynaptic membrane, basically. Okay, uh, so um, the, the um, the uh, V-snare, which is associated with the uh, pre-fusion complex. So basically, when a glutamate um, a vesicle is attached to the cell membrane by uh, the snare proteins, the complex which docks it there is known as the pre-fusion complex. So the proteins involved in the pre-fusion complex are you have one protein which is um, called synaptic brevin, and this is in the cell membrane, th this is in the membrane of the uh, vesicle here, the synaptic vesicle. So it's a V-snare. So this is a V-snare known as synapto brevin. So I'll label that one synapto brevin. Okay, so this is synapto brevin. Synapto brevin. Okay, and then there are two T-snares, which are snare proteins that are uh, suspended within the cell membrane here, the presynaptic membrane. And their names are uh, syntaxin and SNAP25. So basically, syntaxin consists of a single alpha helix, so I'll draw it like that. And by the way, synaptic brevin, again, consists of a single alpha helix. So all these, um, all these snare proteins involved in the formation of the core complex or the pre-fusion complex, whatever you want to call it, they are uh, single alpha helix structures. So synaptic brevin is a great big alpha helix sitting in the membrane. Again, syntaxin, which is a T-snare now, a target snare, is uh, suspended within um, the um, membrane of the um, cell and it's an alpha helix. So this is syntaxin. And the final one that we need to put in is SNAP25, which consists of two alpha helixes. So this is a single molecule of SNAP25, which I'll draw in this V-shape like that. So it's got two alpha helices. And basically, they form complexes together. What with the stoichiometry, one synaptic brevin with one syntaxin with one SNAP25. So this is SNAP25. And 
basically loads of these complexes form between proteins, uh, between these T-snares and V-snares uh, for a single vesicle docking, basically. And those hold, um, hold the um, uh, synaptic vesicle to the presynaptic membrane. Okay, so this is known as a core complex or a prefusion complex. Core complex. Okay, right, so when calcium goes up, there is another uh, T-snare, basically, in the membranes of these um, synaptic vesicles. So here is our other T-snare, and this T-snare is called synaptotagmin. Okay, so I'll colour it in blue. So this is synaptotagmin here. Synaptotagmin. And basically, when calcium goes up, it binds to synaptotagmin. And synaptotagmin interferes with the membrane of the, with, of the cell and with the membrane of the synaptic vesicle. And basically, it causes them to um, fuse. It causes interferences with both. And then they start to disintegrate. And then when they start to re uh, reform bonds with other lipids, they just sort of come together and merge and fuse. So basically, calcium binds to synaptotagmin. And then what happens is that synaptotagmin changes its conformation and sticks itself into the, into the membrane of the, of the cell and basically starts poking around and interfering and disturbing that membrane and making it energetically favourable for the two membranes to start fusing together. And that triggers the exocytosis of the glutamate into uh, the synaptic cleft. So, okay, that's how we get uh, release of the neurotransmitter. So, glutamate is now in the synaptic cleft. It's here. Glutamate. Okay, so now, uh, in the next video, we'll go from there.